program the bookshelf live on western spring television now if you are watching for the first time we are glad to welcome you to the company of leaders yes Le readers are leaders you're welcome my name is dami lola Raphael, and i am a teaching and learning advocate today we'll be treating book facts some are fun some are serious some are just there in between well you tell us what it is or they are to you. Let's go. One of the first book ever written using a typewriter was The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. It is a 35 chapter long book plus a conclusion where Twain hints at the possibility of a sequel. Mark Twain must have had a lot of ink and a lot of Patient. This is a typewriter where you can't use the delete button. Wow, woo, as they would say. Let's move on. The word bookworm originated from insects who live in and eat the binding of books. Likewise, the larvae of various types of insects, inclusive moths, cockroaches, and beetles, may chew and devour the books literally. As a result, a person who loves to read books is idiomatically called a bookworm because they are consuming books one after another. Remember, we've taken on memes and we talked about not letting uh, insects get in the book. All right. Now, if you publish a book in Norway, let's travel, and it passes quality control, the government will buy 100, 200, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 hundred. 1,000 copies. Furthermore, the government will buy 1,500 if it is a children's book and distributes them to libraries throughout the country. Talking about investment in the mental infrastructure of the nation. We're still traveling. Let's go to Iceland. Did you know that Icelandic people read more than anyone? Iceland, that's the country where reading is a national sport. Perhaps it has to do with the weather, or maybe they are just taught to really love books. Either way, Iceland for the win. The English translation of Yola Borgaflot is the Christmas book flood. On Christmas Eve, you'll find most Icelanders snuggled in with a cup of something warm or doing the same thing, reading a book. Yola Bokaflod is an Icelandic tradition in which books are given as Christmas presents and opened on December 24, after which the evening is spent reading the books from a practice begun in 1944 when paper goods were among the most available items in post-war Iceland. Now, the premise is simple. Get a new book to someone you love, Icelandic or not. The giver or the givee or the recipient um, just give a book to someone you love. And I, I think that should be something we should work on at the bookshelf uh, for some time. I've been, I've been making a lot of plans, I promise. But I'm talking about your book of flood. You could also call it Jola Book of Flood. It sounds like Jola. <laughs> Let's move on. Bibliosma. Now, I found Bibliosima in some parts, but I found that the correct term is actually bibliosma bibliosma the word for loving the smell of old books bibliosma is the smell and aroma of a good old book it is best described as the smell of vanilla flowers the chemical reaction behind bibliosma is going to be explained right about now the smell is produced due to the breakdown of the two chemical components in the paper the cellulose and the lining the byproducts of the chemical process produce that 
book odor. As a result of this chemical process, toluene and ethylbenzene produce a sweet odor, while vanillin produces a vanilla odor. In addition, benzaldehyde and phosphoryl produce an almond odor, while 2 acyl hexanol produces a flowery odor. Historical dating uses bibliosma similarly to carbon dating. Because of this, scientists can examine the chemicals produced to know the age of a book. The process is therefore called material degradonomics. Now tell me, we did some science right there. And of course, it's not just wine that's vintage. Books can also be vintage. Let's move on. Author of children's literary works, including The Princess and the Pea, Little Mermaid, and The Emperor's New Clothes. You know that story, right? He's also considered a national treasure in Denmark. I'm talking about Hans Christian Andersen. He had a lot of phobias. He was afraid of dogs. He didn't eat pork because he was worried he would contract trichinia. That's a parasite that can be found in pigs. He kept a long rope in his luggage while traveling in case he needed to escape a fire. He even feared he would accidentally be declared dead and buried alive. So, before bed each night, he propped up a note that read, I only appear to be dead. Anderson met his literary hero, Charles Dickens, at an aristocratic party in 1847. They kept in touch, and a decade later, Anderson came to stay with Dickens at the British author's home in Kent, England. The visit was meant to last two weeks at most, but Anderson ended up staying five weeks to the dismay of the Dickens family. On his first morning there, Anderson proclaimed that it was a Danish custom for one of the sons of the household to shave their male guest. Now, instead of complying, the family set him up with a local barber. Anderson was also prone to tantrums, at one point throwing himself face down on the lawn and sobbing after reading a particularly bad review of one of his books. Yes, they do get bad reviews too. Once Anderson finally left, Dickens wrote and displayed a note that read, Hans Anderson slept in this room for five weeks, which seems to the family ages. Dickens stopped responding to Anderson's letters, which effectively ended their friendship. Let's move on now. Illiteracy, did you know? It is still a huge problem throughout the world. Now, I'm going to dwell on this a bit. One in every five adults around the world cannot read or write, with the highest rates in South and West Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. 20th century philosopher Alfred North Whitehead once said, not ignorant, but the ignorance of ignorance is the death of knowledge. There is a type of illiteracy that threatens us all. It is not the illiteracy why a person is unable to read. It is perhaps the most dangerous and destructive of all the illiteracy. There are different types of illiterates or illiteracy, and according to Applied Scholastics the ORG, one of them is the hidden illiterate. That is the child who wanted a backpack but not a knapsack because he thought a knapsack was a sleeping bag. The office worker who can't figure out why his computer erased an important document. The hidden illiterate is the marketing person who can't seem to finish the promotional piece. That is the dentist whose feelings need to be replaced more often than they should. It's also the mechanic who fixed your car three times for the same problem. Or the student who works hard studying for a history or biology test but never gets a good grade. Hidden illiterate. Now, one way to fight illiteracy is making resources available to the underprivileged children, particularly those in large, remote, and inaccessible areas. By that, I am not waiting for the government. I'm referring to you. I'm talking about me. Now, you would be amazed at how resourceful those old materials, those old books are to those people once you start. I've always said what is regular, what is normal to you is news to somebody else. Let's move on. The Guinness Book of World Records, which inspires tens of thousands of people annually to attempt record-breaking feats, began as an idea 
conceived by British engineer and industrialist Sir Hugh Beaver, the managing director of the Guinness Brewery, to solve trivia questions among bar patrons. During the early 1950s, Beaver was involved in a dispute during a shooting party about the fastest game bird in Europe. However, the answer could not be found in any bird reference book. He sought the help of sports journalists Norris and Ross McWhorter and Guinness Superlatives Limited was founded in November 1954 to handle the book's publication. A year later, the McWhorter brothers published the 198-page first edition of roughly 4,000 entries, which were separated into several chapters, for example, the universe, the human being, the natural worlds, the world structures, and others. Now, after an initial research phase, work began on writing the book, which took 13 and a half 90 hour weeks, including weekends and bank holidays. Little did the McWhorters know that Taking Shape was a book that will go on to become an all time bestseller and one of the most recognized and trusted brands in the world. How many records have we broken so far in Nigeria? Hmm. Now, the first edition, called the Guinness Book of Records, became a bestseller in England in only four months' time. And three more editions were released over the following year. The Marquardt brothers were renowned for their painstaking fact-checking work, often traveling personally to the far corners of the world to observe attempts at record-breaking or to determine whether new and different activities and curiosities were worthy of inclusion in the book. More than sixty thousand. Well. Beg your pardon, more than 60,000 Guinness World Records had been catalogued in the publication's database by 2022. Although the books never did tackle this original question, owing to their focus purely on world records, the red breasted Manganza would be the most likely answer. It is fully migratory and still occasionally hunted. That was the answer to that question, right? So, so uh, let us move on. They said the book never answered. The book for which purpose it was created never met its own purpose but was meeting other people's purposes amazing all right ah now this one an apple a day they say keeps the doctor away i'm kidding teddy Ruse, aka theodore roosevelt was credited with reading at least one or up to four or more books daily his top three reading tips based on our preference include one fathers and mothers who are wise can train their children first to practice and soon to like the sustained mental application necessary to enjoy good books. Talking about parental responsibility. Two, a book must be interesting to the particular reader at that particular time. Three, A, the reader, the book lover, must meet his own needs without paying too much attention to what his neighbors say those needs should be. And three, B, he must not hypocritically pre pretend to like what he does not like. Hey, 3A and 3B are one family. <laughs> I wanted to put it in, in a nutshell. I didn't want to go beyond 3, so I came up with 3A, 3B. Bottom line, if you read 20 minutes a day, you would have read 1.8 million words in one year. If you do 5 minutes daily, then you are 282,000 words rich. And if you just do one minute daily, you get 8,000 words uh, buoyant. I mean, you want to do much more than 8,000. Why not let's do the 20 minutes or more, if and when you can. Let's move on. John Grisham's childhood dream was becoming a professional football player. He served briefly as a politician, went on to law school thinking he studied tax law, but he found that he enjoyed performing in the courtroom. So, he ended up becoming a criminal defense and personal injury lawyer in South Haven, Mississippi. His experiences in court would become the inspiration for his hugely successful legal thrillers. Quoting him now, he said, I seriously doubt I would have ever written the first story had I not been a lawyer. I never dreamed of being a writer. I only wrote after witnessing a trial. Remember, we brought someone who worked in fire service one time in his life, now an accountant, but did a book because of that experience. Now, Grisham's first book, A Time to Kill, was written after hearing the testimony of a young rape victim. 
the manuscript was rejected 28 times, but it was eventually picked up by a small publisher called Wingwood Press. Sales were so bad that Bisham bought 1,000 copies and tried to sell them himself. I remember reading about uh, an author, he, I, I will work on bringing him on, who talked about how that he had to buy his own books himself and sell to make profits. Amazing. Let's move on. The famous novel, Alice in Wonderland, is based on a real 10-year-old girl. Alice's full name was Alice Lytle, and her family was close friends with also Lewis Carroll. Original name, Charles Ludwig Dotson. I mean, such a name. Pen name is better, Lewis Carroll. While on a boating trip, Alice asked Lewis to tell her a story. And finally, Alice in Wonderland was bo born on that day. How many times have you had to conjure stories just to satiate the needs of a particular child at different times? I have done. Moving on, Charles Dickens. Maybe I should write it, right? Okay. And Charles Dickens now, an English writer and social critic, owned a bookcase that works as a secret door in his house. And it was filled with fake books bearing amusing names, including The Art of Cutting Teeth, The Lives of a Cat, which came in nine volumes, and Jonah's Account of the Whale. He also used fake books as decoration for his library. Now, Charles Dickens was a man who never grew a beard until he was four, in his 40s. He wrote his first book 12 years after starting work at the factory. Then, at the age of 12, upon quitting his acting dream, because of a woman, he ended up never marrying. Can you beat that? But, I mean, that experience was helpful. So, I'm going to come up with a term now. Anthropodermic bibliopagy. <laughs> Anthropodermic bibliopagy is the practice of binding books in human skin. Ooh. That sucks. There are four law books bound in human skin at the Harvard University Library. There are actually several books known to be bound in human skin. Interestingly, it was mainly doctors who bound these books. There are also several books bound in animal skin. Did you know that the most sold book is the Bible? From the Greek word Biblia meaning little books. The Bible is a collection of 66 sacred books written over a period of approximately 1,600 years containing history, laws, prophecy, poetry, proverbs, songs, and letters. 1,600 years. Now, according to J.W. the O.R.G., if a businessman directs his secretary to write a message on his behalf, perhaps even giving the gist of it, the businessman is still the author of the message. Likewise, even though God used men to write his message, he is the real author of the Bible. Now, this particular one, you know, there's been a whole lot of back and forth who wrote it, who didn't write it, and then, of course, J.W. Uh, the ORG giving that explanation right there and uh, you know talking about how okay so if you are boss okay and then you tell your secretary uh, to come up with uh, a, a speech to deliver and then you just okay give a rundown this is what I think I want and then you move and then your secretary does the job who owns the statement sometimes you're listening in the news the vice president or the president, the governor, the chairperson, the chairman who was represented by XYZ said, now who was saying, not the XYZ anymore, it's this, the um, superior, all right? So um, that's the argument according to JW.org, uh, saying God is the author, even though he inspired uh, people to write and then they also paint, uh, put pen to paper, penning all of those thoughts and inspiration down. It was still God. Uh, it is, I mean, still God, uh, who is the author of the Bible. And the fact that it took so long, for me, that's something we should pick from. Irrespective of however long, oh, this manuscript, I've had it for five years, I've had it for 10 years, 15 years. If I didn't publish it then, I don't think I would ever be able to publish it. You can still do it. <laughs> <laughs> 1,600 years to complete the Bible. And of course, we've been having so many uh, different translations of that 
a particular material being the most read all over the world uh that is really a feat a real big feat i should say now remember at the beginning we said that these facts some of them are serious some of them are fun and some of them are just in between and you you are the one who would have to define what what is to you what has it been like the different facts that you have heard and for me i would say that it is you looking into the life one, one of the other facts you know a whole lot of facts i mean all around the world one of the other, other facts i found in the course of putting all of this together is the fact that when you read about other people's stories or you read about the past it helps you to ease off the stress of or the tension of whatever it is that you're going through right now knowing that hey somebody has gone through something that well maybe looks like what you're experiencing or maybe peculiar to them and then you're wondering how could that could you have happened and then you come back into the now into reality into the present and you go okay so i'm here now and i have my own issues but then again going to read about all this as i said the past and other people's experiences still releases you from the tension and it is said that readers, I said readers are leaders, right? Readers seem to be happier and have um, longevity, a longer lifespan than people who don't read. Hey, you're a reader. That's why you're logged on to the bookshelf. And if you join us for the first time, as I said earlier, you are welcome. Join the chariot of those who are going to be bringing other people on to be readers so they can lead better, happier, and the longer, healthier lives. Now, finally. Did you know that we have been discussing book facts for about half an hour? One day soon, it's going to be us discussing you, your experience, your success story. And I really want to thank you for staying all through with us. Now, build your life. Forgive yourself, forgive your errors, and forgive others. Write or create your own story. The bookshelf is here to help you to show it to the world. Remember that success is not final. Neither is failure fatal. It is the courage to continue that count. That manuscript, 100 years, 1,600 years. Remember, the courage to continue is what counts. My name is Dami Lola Raphael, and I look forward to seeing you the next time on the bookshelf. Until then, it is goodbye and God bless. is a culture on its own. It has its own language, its own people, 